afternoon and welcome to BBC Two. Welcome to Back to the 80s, the podcast that travels back through time in a rose-tinted DeLorean. Yes, everybody, it's me, Dreadwind, a.k.a. Glenn, uh, saying hello, as always, because it's time for another trip back in the nostalgia TARDIS with another guest. And the guest this week, well, we've had her on before, but we're going to have her on again because I've been on her podcast at least twice. Totally fair, right? <laughs> uh, plus, she's really interesting and she's here to talk to us about something that's that's really super cool from the 80s. It is, of course, from the quite marvellous Eccentric Earth podcast. It's Amy Walker. Hi. How are you? I'm really good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, not too bad at all. Not too bad at all. Um like I was just saying before we started, just recovering all my stuff from the horrendous Microsoft update that basically knackered mine and everybody else's computer, it would seem. Um, I lost so many people who've lost loads of work down to that stupid update. And nobody asked for it. That's the worst thing. Nobody ever asks for this shit. But never mind. Um, other than that, though, I'm, I'm doing all right. And, and you yourself, you're doing OK? Yeah, yeah, I'm doing very good. Thank you. Oh, great stuff. Been up too much at all? Um, Not a great deal. I've been on holiday, had a week away to try and recharge and get refreshed back into the podcasting mood. And mm. this is the first one I've done since coming back. So you're going to oh. have me at my peak in theory. <laughs> Excellent. So, well, we're very honoured to have you, as always. Uh, and you're here to talk about, I can say something super, super cool, because you've chosen the um, 1986 James Cameron movie, Aliens. Yes, one of my all-time favourite films. And why wouldn't it be? It's amazing. <laughs> it is a good one. Uh, but we'll talk about that in, in just a second, though. Um, bought anything recently? Got anything? Picked anything up on holiday at all that's interesting? Um, oh, God. Um, what stuff have I got recently? <laughs> um, I'm just trying to think. Um Uh, we recently picked up the new Star Wars film, uh, The Force of... Uh, Last Jedi, that's the Last one. Last Jedi, yeah, yeah. Um, on 4K, and, oh, and cool. tried that out, the first thing we ever watched on 4K, and didn't think it looked any different from Blu-ray, so we were happy with the film, but not really impressed by the visuals. <laughs> oh, never mind. But I'm sure it's something that will be noticed in years down the line, so... When technology catches up with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's, that's the problem. It's like 3D television never really caught on. Because no. it's just, we, we're not quite there yet. No, it's. I, I think it's still a good way off before it's anything other than headache inducing. <laughs> exactly. And I don't want to wear stupid glasses, frankly. I only yeah. wear stupid glasses. I don't want to wear even stupider ones. Uh, exactly the same reasons as me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, anything else you picked up at all? Um... Since I've been on it, I've, I've got a new pet rabbit. Um, oh, there we are. That's pretty cool. He's a lot of fun. <laughs> it's a little house bunny, so he just runs around causing havoc. Yeah, they do. Especially that. now that he's figured out how to get up and down stairs. It's um, quite okay. terrifying when he suddenly appears. <laughs> yes, and starts gnawing on everything. Yeah, that as well. <laughs> yeah, they do that. 
Excellent stuff. Um, me, myself, well, I think the only thing I've picked up since I was last on a podcast was, um, you might notice it's World Cup year this year. So it's uh, all very exciting. And I thought, Do you know what? I've never had a nice England shirt, so I'm going to get a nice England shirt. So I, I bought two. Um, there's a company called Score Draw. Basically do retro football kits and, and sort of kits from the past that you you can't get them anymore um, because okay. they're, they're, they're not things that sort of, you know, they're not built to last the test of time and mm. yeah, that kind of thing. So um, I picked up the home and away Italia 90 England strips because that's basically my favourite tournament ever. And uh, I really like the shirts and I thought, yeah, you know, I, the, modern football shirts do not go well if you're a bit of a fat bloater like me. <laughs> Because they're all climber cool and clingy, and you know they're, they're only they're sort of made, they're built to stick to bodies that basically haven't seen the ravages of time, um, and, and mine has. So it's yeah, they, they don't fit and they they look silly. So I thought I'll get I'll get retro ones because they're made for fat bastards to be in. So that's that's yeah, <laughs> they look good. I do want the um, I found out recently they do the third one as well, uh, which is the blue. Uh, the 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 one that if you've ever seen the World in Motion video by New Order, it's the one Bernard Sumner wears, um, and it's like, yeah, I really want that one too. <laughs> so yeah, uh, gonna get that one I think uh, next time I get paid because they're they're super cool and they're really nice to wear and yes, uh, but I think that's pretty much it. Um, yeah, cause I'm trying to save up for holidays and stuff, so we, we might be going away. Don't know where. We'll be going away somewhere, but we'll, we'll find something. As long as it's not at home, it's always good. <laughs> I wouldn't mind being at home. It's not the worst place in the world to be. Um, as long as I'm not at work, I think. Really. Yeah, I think that's probably defying it better. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I've been watching some Doctor Who because uh, Twitch are showing Doctor Who from the start. And by from the start, I mean 1963. Yeah, I heard about that. That's pretty cool. Um, and they're, I think they're up to the keys of Marinus just as I speak. So obviously they'll be well nice. gone. But it's basically for most of June it's going to last, is this? Um, which is really, really cool. And it, it's nice to see a lot of sort of younger people who, who sort of don't know anything about Doctor Who getting excited about 60s Doctor Who. Um, which just goes to show television makers you don't need to make everything stupid and dumbed down because young people will like it because young people are quite capable of enjoying something that was made 50 years ago yeah and it's great tv even now yeah stop selling them short assholes <laughs> um but yeah they all seem to be enjoying uh, ian they're enjoying ian a lot he's becoming a bit of a meme i've always liked ian i thought he was a cool companion ian's ace I, i've always yeah um see i i didn't grew up in the 60s obviously so when i was growing up the, the guy character of course excuse me the guy who played him william russell his name is um he was rita's boyfriend in coronation street oh i never knew he was on that <laughs> yeah for a long time i think he died i think his character died um because she was obviously with um she was with a uh mark eden who played marco polo in doctor who as well in the 60s <laughs> he was with his character he's the one that got run over by a tram in blackpool because he was basically gaslighting and, and being generally quite horrible to her, beating her up and stuff. So he was killed, and then her boyfriend after that was uh, Ches Chestington. So that, I thought that was pretty cool when I was a kid. So mm -hmm. I, I, I know him when I watched the Doctor Who for the first time, 60s Doctor Who, and I know him. <laughs> oh, I treat his boyfriend. Yeah, there you go. Cool. And his son was in Harry Potter. I forget his name. I can't remember who we, who we played, though. Um, but his son, um, basically, he's played somebody in, in Harry Potter in the movies. Oh, I didn't know that one. <laughs> yeah. I thought it was pretty cool. Anyway, uh, yes. Yeah, so if you, if you want to, if you are listening to this in, in June and you do want to watch some uh, Doc 2, it's on Twitch. And they're showing it from the start, so they, they might be up to sort of John Pertwee. There's a lot to go through, to be fair. There's a lot of Doctor Who to go through, but that's yeah. really cool. Um, brilliant. We shall go to break and then we shall come back and talk about some aliens then, I think. Uh, we'll start off, um, it's not a long break, but it's from uh, the 27th of May 1984 from the ITV um, Yorkshire Television region. Um, from the, like I say, 27th of May 1984, it starts off with the McLaren advert. Now, not McLaren as in the race cars, brum brums, as in the push chairs. 
that are really super expensive. If you've ever had a kid, I haven't, but I used to sell them at Argos and I know how much they cost. They have a lot of money. Um, narrated by Dennis Waterman, but we won't go into that because he's a truly horrific person. Um, but uh, yeah, McLaren. Uh, and then BT returns September because basically all calls are going to be cheap in September. Um, this is before you could have anybody, um, any company, Sky or NTL, NTL Virgin or whoever, uh, and BT were the only game in town. And, and yeah, phone calls cost a lot of money back then. Like a lot of, I remember there being a lock on the phone. Oh, God. Yeah. Wow. And you certainly, when you got a call, when somebody called you, it was a, it was an event. Uh, back in 1984, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, moving on from that, it's from the Midland Bank, which is now HSBC, if you didn't know. Um, about Euro checks, which is basically like travellers' checks, but just for Europe. Uh, narrating it, obviously, Richard Bryars, because he narrated, uh, oh, sorry, I'd say narrated, did the voice of the Griffin, which was the um, the logo for the Midland for a long, long time. And then it, all of a sudden, there were no Midlands. And it, it seemed to be that quick as well. Like one day, Midland Bank. Next day, what's HSBC? <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. Uh, but yeah, then uh, after that, it's an ad for Tetley's Bitter, not the tea, Tetley's Bitter. And weirdly enough, there's a barman in it, and the barman is played by Jim Bowen of Bullseye fame. Uh, just not, not referring to the fact that he's Jim Bowen or a celebrity, but just playing a barman. Oh, my God. I thought he looked familiar, but I couldn't place him. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a good old Jim Bullseye Bowen. Uh, and like I say, they don't refer to the fact that it's Jim Bowen. He's literally just playing a part, which is super weird. But I guess 1984, Bullseye was just getting famous. He sort of been on the air a couple of years and he was just a jobbing comedian still. And yeah, he, he couldn't have done that post-1984, I don't think. I think Bullseye was way too famous by, by then. And he'd have to be Jim Bowen. Mm. But anyway, very, very odd. But anyway, Tetley's Bitter, and that's one for the Degutori graph. And because this is before Diana died, they're actually talking about news and not... Uh, it's a conspiracy! She was killed! Oh, she was the queen of our hearts. She, she, she wasn't. <laughs> she wasn't. She, she wasn't a very nice person. I'm just, just saying. <laughs> she, 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 she was as bad as, as everybody she hated and made out that they were bad, but... Hey, look, I mean, this, you know, I remember people losing their shit in 1997. Oh, it was just weird. Do you remember that at all? Yeah, I, I can still remember um, being told, oh, well, you got to turn on the news. It's, it's important. It's Princess Di. And I didn't really care much then because of how old I was. I was just like, oh, okay. And then buggered off. Oh, yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I don't, didn't care. <laughs> Oh, it's horrible that somebody died, um, but you know, I'm not a massive fan of the Royals, if I'm being honest. And you know, she didn't really, I didn't know her. Not like we had one first name terms or anything. So it was, it was weird. It was a weird time, and anybody who didn't live through it, yeah, it was odd. But there you go. Um, that's your ad for this time around. We shall be back in a couple of minutes to talk about some shooty bang bang, Michael Bean, Paul Reiser, face palmy. Horrible alien, bitch queen mother from hell, and stuff. Bye bye for now. Teenage mutant ninja turtles will return after these messages. Hello? The new wheels have arrived. Very neat. Oh, look, a shopping tray. Beats having a carrier bag swinging around your ear holes, doesn't it? Seat looks comfy. Ah, oh, now that is clever. You can keep an eye on the driver. <laughs> oh, I'd better give her a gurgle. Gurgle, gurgle. Oh, yeah, this is the real McLaren. I don't know why they call it the Dreamer. The new McLaren Dreamer. It's the real McLaren. I gave a letter to the postman. He put it in his sack. Bright and early next morning. Roll upon it, return soon. 
my treat, gang. See, I can use my Midland Euro checks. Euro checks, Griffin? Yes. When I'm abroad, Peter, I can write checks just like at home. Midland converts the foreign currency into pounds and debits my current account. That's simple. That's simple. Over four million shopkeepers welcome Euro checks, and you can cash them in most banks in Europe. Wow. Just one of many Midland travel services, Peter. A bounty, Mario. And don't spare the horses. Senor Griffin, hello. <coughs> you write the more Euro check. I give you the lessons, huh? Midland Euro checks from the listening bank. We've brought some of the cheer up, Kev. Aye, right, it's a message from your old mate, Alf. Well, here we are, down at the pub, having the right hard time of it. <laughs> hey, Alf, remind me what a pint of tetley sounds like. Bet this is the best pint of tetley's you never had, Kev. Don't you get late early? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Kev, got to take the budget for what? Tetley bitter, man. You can't beat him. around the world, people are meeting, in private, making decisions, from cabinet rooms to boardrooms, from state councils to war councils, to town councils and safety councils. A lot of the decisions they make are going to affect you directly. So, if you'd like to be a fly on the wall, you'd be a lot better off reading the Daily Telegraph. We now return to Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And we are back. Hope you enjoyed the ads as much as we did. Amy. Yes. Aliens then. Mm-hmm. Um let's let's give a bit of bit of context. So in nineteen seventy-nine, Ridley Scott directed a film called Alien, which is basically a slasher horror in space with a creature that's brought on board by accident and bursts through John Hurt's chest, terrifying everybody and putting lots of people off the dinner. And it goes around the ship, killing the inhabitants of the ship apart from one person, Ellen Ripley, played by the quite marvellous Sigourney Weaver. And her cat. Didn't kill her cat. (laughs) At the end of that film, she goes into stasis on, on the ship, the Nostromo, and basically points it towards civilization after having blown the alien or the xenomorph or whatever you want to call it out into space. And he made a lot of money and loads of people liked it. In fact, it grossed $180 million worldwide, which is, uh, sorry, um, the original. Uh, let's have a look. How much did it gross? It grossed a lot of money in the 1979, especially in, in that sort of era's money. Um, but yes, so it did very, very well. And Fox... We're thinking of bringing out a sequel. Kept putting it off, kept putting it off. Um, and eventually, um, Gordon Carroll, David Geiler and Walter Hill of Brandywine Productions decided um, to, to push for a sequel in 1984. Invited James Cameron to write a film because of Cameron's work on The Terminator. And this, this basically would be the sequel for, for Aliens. So Cameron wrote it. Um, in 1984, Fox Green lit it. And they said Cameron could be the director. The budget, can can you think of what the budget might be, Amy? Do you know what the budget was? Oh, um, I do know it because I've, I, I, I've seen them talk about this film so many times. But I mm. don't know the number off the top of my head. I know it wasn't very big at all. No, I mean, it was big in 1986 money, I guess, but it wasn't big in, in sort of what, what you consider blockbusters to be. It's $18 million. Wow. Which is, like, so <laughs> that, to, to, these days, that would be a low-budget movie. Yeah. I mean, I think, wasn't Deadpool something like $60 million or something? Something like that. Um, I mean, to put it into context, Solo this weekend, they're saying it underperformed. It made $83 million. Yeah. I wish I could underperform and make eighty three million dollars. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, me or me both. Um, but there you go. Um, it was filmed in England because, of course, it was at Pinewood Studios and a mm-hmm. decommissioned power plant in Acton. Um, released on the eighteenth of July, nineteen eighty six, and like I say, grossed eight hundred eighty million dollars worldwide. Uh, it was nominated for seven Academy Awards, but sadly, none of them in the important 
<laughs> important bit. Um, although uh, Sigourney Weaver did get past the actress, but there's no way she was winning it. Um, won but eight she was the first um, woman from a sci-fi film to get yes. nominated for it. So kind of cool. Oh, absolutely cool. Um, Big recognition but... for sci-fi. Yeah, and, and that's that's the last time it would ever happen, <laughs> <laughs> basically. Um, other than that, I mean, we're, we're talking proper balls-to-the-wall sci-fi. We're not talking bloody Solaris or anything like that. Which yeah. Is, that's sci-fi in the old fashion sense of it, isn't it? Oh, yeah, but it's like an allegory for like... No, no, no. We're talking sci-fi actual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It means what it says. Set in space, not an allegory. Um, but yeah, it won eight Saturn Awards. Uh, it won Best Science Fiction Film, Best Actress uh, for Weaver, Best Supporting Actor for Paxton. Bill Paxton was in it. Um, Best Supporting Actress for Goldstein, who I think she's Vasquez, isn't she? Yes. Because she's fucking awesome. Um, and Best Director and Best Writing for Cameron. And it won a Hugo Award for Best Dramatic Presentation as well. And Empire, they voted it the greatest film sequel of all time uh, and the seventh highest grossing film of 1986, which isn't bad considering what it was. Um, okay why do you like this film so much then Amy um, mainly because this is one of the films that I grew up with um, I watched it way younger than I should have that's um, a dumb. That's a <laughs> it was one of the staples that I would watch every couple of weeks mm. um, I'd stay around my nan's every weekend on the Friday night to give my mum a break from me. And this is one of the videos they had there. So it quite often get put in my regular watching rotation. And yeah, I, I just loved everything about it. Even though I'd never seen the first film when I saw yeah. aliens, I, I, it explains enough in the first part of the film that you get everything. And then it's just awesome horror and action and great character moments. And it's kind of like a roller coaster ride because it's got the slow build and then big action, then low, slow tension, more action, more slow moving tension, and then the the big dramatic fight with the queen and the load. It's like it's just so many ups and downs to the film. The pacing's brilliant. The effects look phenomenal, especially like you said, considering the budget they've got. Mm. So yeah, it's just always been one that I've super appreciated and loved, and I think it's possibly. Cameron's best work it's certainly one of them um, I think it's it sort of tied there for me with the Terminator yeah the um, original Terminator is fantastic oh it's a brilliant film and it's very similar to Aliens it's got the same sort mm. of it hits similar beats yeah and I don't I don't mean that in a bad way at all um, because you know the best films all hit similar beats uh, and like you say it ebbs and flows and I think that's that's a good thing because it keeps you on the edge of your seat I think mm. the problem with action sort of today is that it starts and it's action, 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 action. It doesn't give you a chance to breathe where this does. Yeah. Well, it's like after they've been in the the hive and you've had them decimating that and then they go and it's all, nothing really happens for half hour except mm. they sort of bolster their defences and you have character modes, but that builds the tension because you know the aliens are going to come back. And oh, it's, yeah. It's not as in your face, but that makes it so much better when they do finally turn up. Well, I mean, yeah, it, it, you got that bit because obviously she's in the stasis pod. She's been there for nearly 60 years. So everything's changed. The company seems to have got even more powerful. Mm. And obviously you, you, you've got them saying, oh, well, we, we've heard about this happening on this colony. We're going to wipe them out, but we need you as an advisor. And then you've got Paul Reiser's slimy little ship. <laughs> Which you don't know at that point, but the whole thing is just a masquerade so he can get a face hooker. Yeah. And that's that's pretty much it, because they obviously the company and it's it's similar to Blade Runner, you've got this big all powerful company that just wants to breed super soldiers. And you know it's it's one of those things, it's like um speaking of Doctor Who, again, it's like the power of the Daleks, the Patrick Chowan's first one. It's one of them, it's crushing inevitability. You know that this is a bad idea. You know something's going to mess up royally. But you've just got to watch it play out. And that, again, it's like the Terminator. It's, it's that, uh, it's, it's tension because you know what's going to happen. You kind of know mm. the outcome. 
and you can do nothing about it. Yeah. And and you, I think one of the cleverest things that Cameron did was put Ripley in your shoes. Because mm. she's there saying, this is a stupid idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I've seen this thing. I've fought this thing. It can't be stopped. I nearly killed yeah. myself trying to stop it. Why are you trying to control it? It can't be controlled. Yeah, and and she's like that throughout the film as well. Even she's when she's like that throughout the series at the yeah. <laughs> but it's like when she shuts down Vasquez and Hudson, who are joking around, and she's like, "No, you're not taking this serious." And yeah. then they get their ass kicked, and they're like, "Well, we could do this, this." And she's like, "No, we just leave and nuke them." Yeah. She's like, you're still not getting it. We can't take them on. <laughs> it's you, like... you, them from our bit, it's the only way to be sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, you're quite right. She, she's, you know, she's not lying. She's not messing about. She's saying, no, we can't beat these things. Yeah. And I, I love the fact that you got the, the colonial marines and they're all, yeah, hoo -ah! And all this, you know, we're, we're going to go in there. We're going to kick that thing's ass and we're going to do this. And we're going to do that. And it's like, no, you're not. Yeah, she's just looking at them like, "Oh, you're all going to die." <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, let's let's just let's just talk about the Colonial Marines for just a second. You've got Michael mm -hmm. Bean as Corporal Dwayne Hicks. Obviously, Cameron knows Michael Bean quite well at this point and likes working with him. Um, and I would say Dwayne is probably a bit like Kyle in the Terminator. He's a yeah. similar sort of character. Very quiet and reserved and. A bit more to him than just a soldier, but he kind of keeps it hidden. Yeah. Um, wasn't supposed to be Michael Bean at the start, though, apparently. It was supposed to be James Remar. Yeah, they actually filmed um, some of the scenes in The Hive with him because that was the first stuff they shot with them. And then they had to reshoot it as Michael Bean. But apparently there are a few shots in there that is actually James Remar as well yeah. in the final film. But I've never spotted him <laughs> no i mean he was fired apparently because for drug possession which is a shame because i i really do i really do like him uh which is a shame but i do like michael bean as hicks i think i can't really see anyone yeah. else playing that role um you've got um bill paxton the wonderful bill paxton as private hudson brilliant and he Perfect was that good. <laughs> oh he's, he's brilliant i mean he won a saturn award for it basically um that's that's how you know but this is the period where he's just becoming really famous. He was mm. doing this and he was doing uh, weird science. I think people were just beginning to understand what a great actor Bill Paxton was. Yeah. Which, which is a shame. Um, you've got um, Jeanette Goldstein as Private Vasquez. Mm -hmm. Who has a lot of fans. Um, yeah. Both male and female. <laughs> well, she's Even... just so cool. And I, I think James Cameron said he didn't, Think until they got to the casting stage to make Vasquez a woman, he just wrote her like a man. And then went actually change this around and make Vasquez a woman, and she's pretty awesome. And yet she doesn't act like a woman. I mean, mm. the, act, the actor isn't a woman. You know, it's 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 just one of the boys basically. Yeah. Um, which is you know how it, how it would be how it is in the services. You know, you're not say oh yeah he's just a woman. No, he's you fight alongside, and she's just as tough as the blokes are. And it gives you that great line with her and Bill Paxton. Has anyone yeah. ever mistaken you for a man? <laughs> I don't know. No. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> nah, it's brilliant. Uh, Jeanette Goldstein's quite chuffed to bits that she's become such an icon as well because um, I know quite a few people in the LGBTQ. Is that right? <laughs> I was getting it wrong. Um, but I know <laughs> lots of people in that community who sort of think she's great. And she is. And you don't have to be in that community to think she's great. That's mm. not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that she's a bit of an icon. Yeah. Because uh, effectively, I suppose, she's queer. Um, although showing no... Absolutely no inclination towards women. But there are no other women there other than Ripley. And Ripley kind of doesn't care. Mm. Um, it's her and husband, isn't it, basically? Um, sort of Pretty much, yeah. Get, getting it on. They're, they're clearly getting it on, but they're clearly having to hide it. Um, yeah. But yeah, she's become a massive sort of gay icon and a queer icon, which is awesome. And she's quite yeah. happy with that. Um, awesome. I, I, can tell, I can totally see that. I'm a bit of a feminist icon as well, I would think. <laughs> yeah. Because she's just out there just being a Marine and not really giving a shit about the blokes there with her. So And can probably 
out drink and out fight all of the blokes there as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, just sort of Transformers note as well. Uh, Simon Furman's a massive fan of Aliens and he's a massive fan of Vasquez's character. So in the Matrix quest, one of the moons that the Matrix visits is Viscous, uh, <laughs> which is basically Vasquez. But the whole story is basically an Aliens pastiche. It's got nice. loads of names of uh, the Aliens characters in there, but to the moon itself called Vasquez, which is really cool. And you've got Al Matthews finally as Sergeant Apone. Um, Brilliant. Who is the gunnery <laughs> sergeant? <laughs> yeah, look into my eye. <laughs> he he just. I don't know if it existed before he did this role, or it's just the way public perception has gone because of how iconic these marines are. But if you think of a tough sergeant, mm. he's what exactly what comes to mind. His characteristics, his mannerisms, everything about him. He just. He's perfect for that role. I suppose there's there's two of them in the eighties, isn't there? You've got him, you've got Al Matthews, and you've got Ali Ermi. Mm. Um, that that is the gunnery sergeant trope, basically right there. Um, and and Matthews himself was in the military, so yeah. He, um, again, like Ali Ermi, they were both in the military. They were both, I think, gunnery sergeants. Yeah, well, that's so, one of the reasons they brought him on was to sort of help with the military training and getting everyone sort of in the right mind frame. And I've seen some of the behind the scenes interviews with him and he sounded quite scary oh, in, yeah. in a way. Like he's saying that the cast quickly learned, don't put your fingers on the trigger of your guns because my training is to automatically take that rifle and shove it down your throat. So yeah. it's like, okay, <laughs> that's terrifying, but also makes him, and them very believable when he sort of helped whip them into shape like a real sergeant would. Absolutely. He's got that credibility that you need. Mm. Well, I mean, just looking at his, his wiki here very, very quickly, he says, I spent six years in the United States Marine Corps. I hold 13 combat awards and decorations, including two Purple Hearts. Wow. He, the first black Marine in the 1st Marine Division in Vietnam to be meritoriously promoted to the rank of sergeant. So it wasn't a field commission. He earned it. Um, he served with Kilo Battery, 4th Battalion, 11th Marines, 1st Marine Division, and of that he's very proud, and he fucking should be as well. I mean, that's mm. a badass right there. Yeah. Um, which is which is really cool. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you can't get more verisimilitude than that, basically. Um, you've also got William Hope as the commanding officer, lieutenant, or lieutenant, shall I say, Goldman, uh, who's inexperienced and a bit ineffectual and might as well not be there. Um, yeah. But I love the fact that all the Marines, there's, there's many more of them, including Tip Tipping, the uh, the stuntman Tip Tipping, he was one of them. Um, but there were plenty of soldiers there, and they're all gung ho. They're all, yeah, we're going to kill this thing. We're going on a bug hunt, <laughs> and almost immediately they just get completely wiped out. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're within like sort of five minutes. They're wiped out because yeah, fuck it, they're just shit. They're nothing against the Xenoboss, which are bred for killing. Mm. Um, I mean, just just talking about the aliens, just just for a second. Did those things give you nightmares when you were a kid? Did they scare you, or did you think they were just awesome? Or I think a little bit of both. I they they definitely creeped me out, and I I still think that the out of a lot of these sort of horror characters and creatures and stuff, if they were ever to be real the aliens is the one that would terrify me the most because yeah. you're really fucked. The best thing you can do is try and hide from them. But if they get you, just kill yourself. It's it's better than the alternative kind of horror to it. And yeah, I, I thought as a kid, these are cool, but I would never want to see one. <laughs> no, I mean, they refined the design, didn't they? From, from 1979, because of course, that sort of technology was yeah. seven years further on and Geiger had had a few more ideas. Um, so they did sort of make it sleeker. Mm. And they, they took the dome off as well because they kept cracking. Yes. When they're doing the stunts. But the, I thought the, the ridges inside the dome that you could now see, the, the way they shot them with the the dark rooms and the flashing lights and the smoke, it just made them look creepier, more well, that's skeletal. The, that's that's part of the thing I always had against sort of the more modern movies of, of aliens, and they don't work if they're overlit. Mm. 
they only work. It's like the Daleks. Sorry, bring Doctor Who in it again, but it's like the Daleks. <laughs> if if you shoot them from the top and overlight them, they look ridiculous because they're ridiculous. Mm. If you use a creeper camera and underlight everything, then they're quite creepy. And it's the same with the alien, with the xenomorphs. If you underlight them, then you can't see all the joins. You can't see all the things that make... You can only catch glimpses. And that is much scarier than seeing it overlit. Yeah. I and, think it's, you know, I think it's probably a, a practicality of the time as well, because nowadays they can easily go in and remove suit seams or slim down oh, yeah. the actors and suits but back then it's like well like the alien warriors in the second film they're just guys in spandex suits yeah with bits stuck to them we cannot get them on camera because they all look naff we've got to keep them in darkness and it it kind of tied their hands but it worked for the best as well well it's that whole thing of necessity being the mother of invention isn't mm. it? you know we, we've had to film it like this but actually this works better mm. We, we don't really want to, you know, it, it's better to be underlit. It's better to have steam coming out of things. It's better for it to be, it, you know, for it to be not in HD looking like this because it actually works better for what we're trying to capture in any case. Um, and certainly with the aliens. I mean, the, there's the, you know, one of the tensest part of the film. You don't actually see them. It's just when they've got the scanners out. Oh, God, I, I love that moment. And I, they realise that they're, they're surrounding them. <laughs> It's, it's so great. good. It just oh, just with a little beeping noise. And yeah, it always it's takes like, me back to the games as well. You, you know <laughs> they're there from the beep, and it's so good. And it's a distinctive beep, because it, it isn't beeping, mm. but it's the... And that's scary, because it's, it's not a sound you're familiar with. And like I say, it takes me right back to the PC game. Mm. Yeah. And you know you're fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and that moment has always made me distrust stealing tiles. Yes, no, it's like, I don't like, no, fuck them. I know there's not aliens up there, but I don't like not knowing what's up there. Anything yeah. could be, it's kind of put that little thought in the back of my mind ever since. <laughs> it's that, and then just dropping through and squealing, and the, oh, oh. oh, that's another good thing. That never gets mentioned on anything. It's the sound that the aliens make. Mm. That well, really they, high-pitched squealing sound. They kind of mix in some musical stings in there as well with the yeah. alien sounds in it kind of blurs that line of what's the soundtrack what's the alien but yeah it's it's really cool just the way it's put together well, i mean that was james horner doing the music obviously because he worked a lot with james cameron and he was really good uh, mm. that was a real loss when when he passed away but um yeah it's, it's that whole it's like the dark knight with um the joker uh, with Heath Ledger's Joker, and there's he's got a theme, but you can't hum it because it's just a couple of notes. But it goes right through you. Mm. It's one of those things, music, and it's the same with the Alien. There's, it's not a, a theme as such. It's just like you say, musical things. It's like a lay motif, and it's like, yeah, it puts you on edge. And the whole that's that's one of the things I really like about the Aliens franchise is that the whole thing's not. It's not. It does have jump scares in there. It does have body horror in there. Mainly what it's about is tension. Yeah. And I love me a bit of tension. Mm. And it's a shame when they lose that in later films, when yeah. they try to push the action in, or even like Alien 3. I, have, you, have you seen the extended cut? Yeah, I have. I'm not, a, I'm not a fan. I, one thing I prefer in that is the fact that they capture the alien when they do the fire trap, because it's like... Well, it's not just lurking out there. It's yeah. trapped. You know it's got to come out. And it kind of, that, I think, makes it a bit tenser because, well, something's going to go wrong. It's not just going to turn up. Something's going to go really wrong here. And moments like that where it it lets you be more afraid of what you don't know is going to happen rather than, well, it will show up eventually. It's This is going to be something different here. Yeah, And it kind of freaks you out a bit more. Absolutely, and um, you know that's it's that whole um, that the whole section with the uh, the face hugger as well that's running about the lab. Oh, brilliant! You can't see it, but you can hear it. Yeah, and and y you kind of know they're going to be okay, but you don't know how they're going to get out of it, and that's what yeah. gives you the tension there. And it's such a creepy moment. The little skittering noises on the on the tiles, and ugh. and the fact that you know what <laughs> this thing can do. Yeah. Um, 
And um, but you know, as as with all good sort of alien horror monster movies, the real monsters are actually humans. And in this yep. case, Paul Reiser. Off my two dads. Yes, I mean he's got a douche name, Carter J. Burke, um, but he's uh, from the Wheeling Utani Corp to uh, investigate it, not to bring one back and try and turn it into a super soldier. <laughs> Um, that no. would just be dumb <laughs> that would be silly why would you do that um, but I like the fact that they do this misdirect because of bishops there yeah and as soon as she finds out he's a he's an android well obviously she's had to deal with Ash in the first film Ian Holm who tried killing her but in a particularly horrible way mm. um, but yeah she, she immediately doesn't trust him and it's like he's not the one you don't want to be trusted <laughs> frankly and they I mean, do it so well because he plays it completely straight and I'm just an android here to help. I'm being a nice guy. But he comes across so creepy because of what you've already seen and from Ripley's point of view that you do think, yeah, he's a creepy robot. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, actually, he was just being a nice guy the whole time. Yeah, oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's um, a great misdirect. It's, it's that bit with the knife as well, which has been copied in so yes. many things. And so many... I wonder how many people have injured themselves <laughs> trying to do that. Because we've all done it when we were drunk. Oh, oh yeah. I've, I've, I've done it a number of times. It's like, I'm going to do a bishop. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be fine. Is this going to work out great? <laughs> it doesn't... It never works out great. I'll, I'll nope. I know someone who nearly <laughs> lost a finger doing it. Um, yeah, that was at university. And they had to go to the hospital and get the finger sort of sewn back on a bit. <sighs> wasn't me by the way um, <laughs> but yeah Bishop's a great character and like you mm. say he's playing it completely straight he's a nice guy he's doing what he set out to do uh, and you don't find out until right at the end <laughs> yeah uh, whereas Paul Reiser fucking Burke uh, not a very nice man but he gets his comeuppance yeah he gets his, he gets eaten so good <laughs> good because uh, he does try killing her and Newt as well. So you don't, I haven't mentioned Newt. Um, Newt is um, Jonesy the Cat Mark II, I guess. <laughs> More interactive Jonesy. <laughs> the whole thing is a big, massive allegory about motherhood. Yeah. Um, and she is basically supposed to be Ripley's surrogate daughter. Which, I don't know, I don't... I don't see Ripley as the motherly type. So I never really liked it. I, I understand yeah. she's got to have something to protect. She's got to have something that can be the damsel in distress, I guess, because it, it sure as hell ain't ever going to be Ripley who's a damsel in distress. <laughs> um, so Newt's this innocent child that that is the only survivor of her colony, I think she is. Yeah. Um, for whatever reason. I, th I always thought a great thing at the end would be is if she was actually connected to the Queen in some way, but that's just me. Uh, she isn't. Um she was uh, basically um, lots of school children were auditioned, but a lot of them were already sort of previous actors and they were accustomed to smiling after saying their mm -hmm. lines. So uh, Carrie Hen, who played Newt, was chosen out of 500 children for the role, which had no previous acting experience, so she, she obviously wouldn't be doing that. Um, she did receive a Saturn Award, but like a lot of child actors, decided it wasn't for her acting and uh, became a teacher. Yeah, the, the only role she ever did and it was great. <laughs> well, that's like um, that's like the kid who played Charlie in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. Um, he became a vet. He just said, no, nah, right after the role, right after filming, he said, no, nah, not for me. Mm. I think Richard Lester did as well. No, is it Richard Lester? I think his name is Richard Lester. The guy who played Oliver. I think he did something very similar. And he did a few sure roles after. Um, well, it's the... Said, um, not for me. The young man who played Joffrey in Game of Thrones... He's gone on quit acting to go and pursue becoming a professor at university. I can sort of see that. I can see that because good. once you've played Joffrey, you're never going to get a role as yeah. good as that again. You, ever. You, you've peaked. Yeah. <laughs> and you're always going to be known as Joffrey. Yeah. That's the other thing. But, you know, once you've played Joffrey, why would you want to play anything else? Because mm. that is a role of a lifetime. Um, so I can kind of understand you can always go back to it, but if it's you know if it's not for you, then yeah. why would you keep doing it? Because there's so many child actors out there unhappy. Mm. Um, Macaulay Culkin, um, <laughs> oddly, oddly enough, not Daniel Radcliffe. He's having a whale of a time. <laughs> That's because he's in weird shit. That's why. 
Yeah. <laughs> Swiss Army Man, which is a weird film. Um, but it's great. Everyone should see Swiss Army Man. After watching Aliens, of course. Uh, but yeah, she chose not to do anything else, um, which is, I, I guess, fair enough, isn't it? Mm. Um, but yeah, um, oddly enough, for a film filmed in Britain, Cameron did opt to hire actors or, uh, who actually had American accents or could imitate it really well. So um, 3,000 individuals in the UK were unsuccessfully auditioned. Wow, which is a big number. <laughs> yeah. I guess well, he just wanted it credit. It was yeah. the whole credibility thing. I suppose as well, once it came out, it's the sequel to Alien. A lot of people would want to be in that without even yeah. knowing what it was going to be. It was like, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> yeah. And I guess you've got to also remember back in this time, vocal coaches weren't the greatest. There's mm. loads of films from the 80s and loads of films from the early 90s where you get people who clearly can't do American accents. Bob Hoskins, I'm looking at you here. Um, <laughs> I love your work in Roger Rabbit, and I really enjoyed Mermaids, but your American accent leaves a lot to be desired. <laughs> uh, and But it was the same for a lot of American, uh, sorry, British actors doing American accents. They just couldn't do it um, because you just didn't get good enough vocal coaches to, to be able to do it in the 90s and sort of early 2000s. That changed. And you get people like Hugh Laurie, who... Brian Singer didn't realise for the first five seasons of House that Hugh Laurie was British. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it's, it's easy for... I've heard some people have a go at his American accent and say it was rubbish, but um, no, there's a lot of Americans I know thought he was American. So it weren't that bad. It's just because we know him as Prince George. That's all it is. Yeah. <laughs> um, that's, that's what it is. Um so, yeah, um, the, the actual filming, it was filmed over 10 months, as we say, it was a uh, budget of 18 million. But Cameron, um, he could work with low budgets and he could work with deadlines because he'd worked with Roger Corman on Battle Beyond the Stars, which is a fantastic film. But he was basically one of the effects directors on that. That's where he started. So he wasn't phased by the fact that he had to work to this, this rather low budget. So they just made do with what they had. Um, they shot, like you say, in Pinewood Studios. The other place that they shot was uh, a decommissioned power lake, uh, sorry, um, power station, which is in Axon Lane. Yeah. Um, they thought it was a great place to film because it was grilled walkways and numerous corridors and it, the, that old Doctor Who thing of walk, running down corridors. It's good. It's cheap. Um, you can underlight them and it looks cool. And uh, But they did have to spend a lot of money to get asbestos removed on it. <laughs> yeah. But it was worth it because it looks amazing. Oh, it was great. It was used in Red Dwarf as well, if I remember correctly. Some of it. All the and sets were used in Red Dwarf. It was also um, the Ace Chemicals plant in the 89 Batman movie. Yeah, it was. It was the Axis Chemicals plant. Yeah. Um, which you can sort of tell, which is great. Yeah. If you've seen Aliens a few times and then you watch that, it's like, well, that's oh, yeah. that's the atmosphere process of what the hell? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I definitely, all, all, a lot of the sets were used for Red, Red Dwarf, which is funny because Red Dwarf is sort of based on uh, on aliens some of it was anyway and obviously polymorph was heavily mm. um but yeah the design was done by sid mead who i think he would yeah he had worked on blade runner he'd worked on 2010 he'd worked on tron so he he knew what he was doing um and he wanted to make all the military stuff look like military stuff so basically what he did is look at stuff that's around now and just extrapolated Mm. said what what would that change into a few years down the line um so you've got the apc which kind of reminds me now um of the uh, tumbler from the batman films it does look yeah. a bit like that it's yeah now you're saying that it's got that same sort of feel to it yeah and the drop ship itself was based on the ah1 cobra which is used in vietnam because mm-hmm. of course this whole film was a massive Vietnam allegory as well. <laughs> oh, God, yeah. The gung-ho Marines coming in and getting their asses kicked by the guys without any tech. <laughs> yeah. Because, they, well, they are the tech. Yeah. Basically. Um, so, yeah, I mean, obviously the, the visual effects, like we say, uh, Cameron had worked on several Roger Corman movies, and Roger Corman is the king of... Um, using miniatures, using sets, using special effects, a great effect. Um, 
the uh, practical effects supervisor is a guy named John Richardson. He actually won a special effects Oscar for his stuff. He said his biggest challenge was creating the forklift, the power loader exoskeletons, which required mm. only three months of work. Um, but Cameron complained about visual direct um, uh, details during construction as well. The model couldn't stand on its own, so it ha- either had to have wires dangling from the shoulders or a pole through the back attached to the cane. So when she, Zikoni Weaver, was inside the power loader unit, you had a stuntman standing behind it who moved the arms and legs. So it's basically some massive puppet. Yeah. Um, which is which is awesome. But it, the effect of it is brilliant. I love the power loader. Yeah, even though it's a fake piece and it's been held up a while, as soon as they've put the mechanical noises in there and the clunks of the metal, it, it feels so real and looks big and heavy. And it it's a great, great piece of design and... As soon as you see it in the early stage of the film, you kind of know it's coming back later on oh, yeah. because <laughs> it's it's so cool. It's like it can't just be for this one shot where she makes a little joke. Hey, what's that thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that thing's this thing. It's really heavy and can be used to hit things. Ah, oh, right, okay. I'll bear that in mind. Foreshadowing. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, obviously it comes into its own when the alien queen appears and she has to hit a um, big massive fight with the alien queen. Yeah. Which is fantastic. I love the Alien Queen. That was um, Sam Winston's company made, the Alien Queen, if I remember mm. correctly. Um, 14 foot tall she was. Uh, she was Three operated... guys inside as well, wasn't it? Or something like that. Yeah. Mixture of puppeteers, control rods, hydraulics, cables, crane to support it. Two puppeteers were inside the suit operating its arms. 16 were required to move it. Wow. Uh, and all sequences involving the full-size queen were filmed in camera with no post-production manipulation. Yeah. So what you see is what Sigourney Weaver saw. That's a fantastic. hell of a puppet. <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of reminds me a bit of Jabba from Star Wars. Obviously, that's a similar sort of setup. Um, but obviously, the Alien Queen way more intricate. Yeah. Um, but this thing, I mean, you, you watch the Alien Queen. She moves. She actually moves and stuff. It's brilliant. Mm. The, the amount of work. No wonder they won Oscars, you know? Um, but yeah, she was she was massive. Like I say, 14 feet tall is big. Mm. So the amount of skill that it took to, to, to move this bloody thing was amazing. And, and it's considering how long ago it was and the tech they had to work with and the fact that they made a lot of this themselves and the size of it, they put so much little movement in it as well, like the way it will turn its head ever so slightly and it will sort of shift on its feet as it's about to attack Ripley. It's got some very subtle movements to it that you wouldn't expect from two guys strapped in a giant suit hanging from a crane should be able to do. That's what happens when you get people at the top of their game doing what they mm. do best and just let them get on with it and, and trust them. Um, and it's it's something, sadly, that is becoming a bit obsolete now because it's far easier and far cheaper just to animate it. Mm-hmm. And practical effect. They are coming back. There are a lot of people using them. I think it, it's like anything. I'm, I'm not anti-CGI. I know a lot of people are these days. I'm not anti-CGI. I think it should be used as part of things, not the whole thing. Yeah. It's got its place. I mm. think really what people should be aiming for is a mixture of the two. Because as, as with the best will in the world, something CG is still something CG. Yeah. And it will never replace something actually being physically there. Yeah, I I remember watching some of the making of the first Alien vs. Predator film, and Mm. um, is it Dan Woodruff and Alec Guinness? I think so. Who do the alien suit work from three onwards. They were saying how most of the fights is them in the suit, and then they use CG to enhance it, do a few shots they couldn't, and sort of take wires out from the stunts, but they're on one of the commentary tracks for the, Mm. the film. And in that, they were like, is this us or is that the CG? It's like, I, I can't really remember. And it's, if you can get to the point where they're that interchangeable and yeah. that good working together, that's what you need the CG for rather than fully CG aliens, you know, yeah. have people in suits and then just give them a touch up just to push them into that extra special area. Yeah. And I think that's what they do with things like the modern Star Wars films. Mm. Um, yeah, so much of that is practical and it looks better because of it. I, I think so. I mean, you've obviously got in the early 2000s this rush of CG films, especially mm. CG horror. 
Uh, things like fake CG blood, and that never works. Oh, that's just awful. <laughs> it just never, never looks good. Uh, one of the one of the th- uh, types of films I liked were the Final Destination films because they would do a mix of that physical effect stuff and CGI, mm. and they would use fake blood and they would use CGI blood, but the, the the CGI blood was just used to enhance what was already there, and that that is fine. Um, yeah. And but I think you know there is a place, and I think it, we are getting back to it where physical effects are the, the things that people want to see. And they look mm. at films like Aliens and they think, yeah, that's you can tell that's there. Uh, and you can't really replace that at the moment. I mean, you might be able to in the future, but at the moment you certainly can't. Um, but yeah, um, so obviously you've, you've got the tension there with the aliens. You've got the aliens themselves moving. And as you said, a lot of it is just people in um, spandex suits. Yeah. But Cameron was really clever because one of the things he did was get dancers. Mm. The good thing about dancers is that they use their bodies a lot and they're able to twist and contort and do things that people would think maybe aren't possible. Mm. Because I think one of the best things about the aliens themselves is they contort themselves into weird shapes. Yeah, it's it's that moment where they start coming out of the hive and they're coming out of the floor and twisting round as they get up or coming out of the walls but unfurling as they do it's it's not just they were there the whole time it's they're creepy about it as well <laughs> yeah i think that it's, it's part of the sort of morbid fascination that people have with them because they're based on sort of insects mm. and we, we're you know humans are scared of insects because they're not like us in any way yeah. shape or form they're not humanoid and although the aliens are xenomorphs, although they are humanoid, they're not like us. No, they're one of the more completely removed aliens you're going to see on screen in most films, and it makes them stand out because of that. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of metallic, but not... I mean, the, the other good thing, that even the Alien versus Predator films, and even the more modern Alien films, I wish sort of Ridley Scott would stop trying to do an origin i don't want an origin story for them i don't want to know mm. where they're from i don't they just are yeah it's it's like the joker whenever they're trying to give the joker an origin story people get really angry because it's like we don't need one he just mm. is uh, and it's you know it's the same with with the they, you know you don't have an origin story for parasitic wasps that they're based on you know they, ju- yeah. they just are they're something that's popped up in nature that's horrible and horrific and they're not evil per se, but then just not very pleasant. Mm. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. It's, I know with, um, especially the last one they did, um, Covenant, they, they went way more into it than I was wanting. I, there's, there's a lot more in there that I didn't pick up on first time round. Like the character David isn't like, expressly making the aliens he's recreating them from mm. stuff the engineers had already found and all that but it's still it's it's too much i don't want to know that yeah you know if if he does do his third one and he clarifies this is like an offshoot strain and it isn't the aliens that we know and love from the other films that would work a bit better but then it would kind of be is a bit pointless really <laughs> it's yeah but saying that, it's never yeah. alien film, so I do enjoy it. <laughs> I, I I watched part of Prometheus and thought, you know, what, I'm good. <laughs> I'm all right. I don't, I don't need to. I've got Alien and Aliens. I'm not keen on Alien Three. The fucking fourth one is an abomination. Yeah, well, even the the writer takes the piss out of that in his other projects as often as he can. So it shows you how bad it is. <laughs> yeah, the, the Joss Whedon version basically, like most Joss Whedon things, hates women. So, yeah. <laughs> he fetishizes Ripley. I kind of said that years ago, dudes with Buffy. <laughs> mm. A bit creepy for a 40 odd year old man to be writing about a teenage girl like this. Yeah. But then again, they should never have brought her back after Glory killed her. But there you go. That's another story for another time. <laughs> and which is why Angel's the better of the two shows because yes. it's not about a teenage girl. No, <laughs> it's about a teenage boy. Kind of, um, but uh, yeah, it, it 
did very very well did aliens um you got the ma- like you say you got the massive bit at the end where it's just action orgasm um and it just all goes to shit and then bishop gets ripped to pieces spoilers <laughs> really easily as well because I, I he gets impaled with the alien queen's tail doesn't he yeah she, rips him she lifts him up and then rips him in half it's a really shocking scene especially the first time where you whilst yeah the alien queen was there she came up in the lift you could easily think all oh, right maybe it's not over it felt very much like an end when yeah. they got on oh, the it's, ship it's... it's all like oh we're, we're finally safe and you could easily think okay that's it now it's done and then suddenly boom giant tail it's it's a proper what the hell moment and then that's where you get the famous line Away from her, you bitch. <laughs> yeah, but then Look again, the queen's queen's got a point. <laughs> it just killed all her children. Yeah, for for really no reason. It's, I... you know, it's, 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 it's this sort of uh, battle of attrition for survival, isn't it? It's it's not because like I can say I can, I must stress this every time the aliens pop up is that they're not evil. No, they're just doing what they do. Yeah, they're surviving, and we just want to survive more than mm. they do. Um, and so I do love that moment where she's in the hive with her as well, and she threatens the eggs, and the queen makes the other aliens back off and stuff. And it's yeah. like it's it's a very interesting moment because you wouldn't normally get something like that from a pure monster, but it shows a level of intelligence to the alien that you probably don't get elsewhere in the series and it also makes it personal between her and the queen at the end. And yeah. It's, it's a really cool moment that I think gets overlooked by a lot of the other parts of the film because the film is so full of good moments. Oh yeah, absolutely. No, no, you're quite right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the, the queen is obviously more intelligent than I say the drones, I suppose you mm. could call them. Um, you know, and yeah, it's, it's fantastic. It's where she threatens the eggs with the flamethrower. And she says, no, back off. Yeah. And then Ripley kills him anyway. So. Yeah, <laughs> and then, then Ripley's broke. got severe PTSD. <laughs> yeah, the, R- Ripley's broken by this point. Um, and then they nuke it, which they should have done to begin with, really, but never mind. Fuck it, eh? Um, <laughs> and then, like I say, Bishop gets torn in half. She advances on nuke because she's basically, you killed my children, I'm going to kill yours. Uh, yeah. And then you have the climactic battle with the power loader and the alien queen. Queen gets chucked out into space. Um, and then that's, that's basically it. That's that's the end of it. They yeah. all um, enter high. And they go to bed. <laughs> and then Newt, Hicks and Bishop get screwed over in the next one. Yeah. Killed off camera. Yeah. I, I like the third film. I'm I think it's one that's grown on me more. Yeah. But I do think it's a shame those three characters end the way they do yeah bishop gets a little bit of an extra scene but yeah it's still not great for three really cool characters yeah and they weren't even asked back is is the thing that kills me about it Mm. um they they didn't they they had no plans to have them in the next film um i think alien and then the alien franchise it suffers from never having had a clear vision of what they want to do i like yeah. the fact that the first two films are so completely different mm. um and i think that was the plan all along to have different genres uh, so obviously you've got your, your your slasher horror which is the first one you've got your um your action film you've got your i don't know almost it's it's not really a slasher horror again it's almost like a sort of submarine drama Mm. Uh, you know, and a sort of one of these these. She knows she's dying, so she's got to she got to kill herself before that happens, and they're all trying to stop her from killing herself, and and then it goes weird at the end. It's a weird film. It's the third one, but that again, it, it suffers from studio interference. Yeah, the the production on that film. If you go and watch like the behind the scenes stuff, it's amazing. There's even a half decent movie from it. Yeah, you know. It's, <laughs> The yeah. like the alternate version where it's going to be monks in a wooden planet and then studio interference with the directors and the actors. It's like fair play to David Fincher for getting what he did out of it. Didn't work out too badly for him though, did it? No, he's, he's done all right. He's done all right, hasn't he? <laughs> he's, he's done yeah. okay. Um, and then the fourth one is just fuck it, it's a mess. 
It's yeah. just terrible. It's just a terrible film. It's an ab- um, oh, yeah, abomination movie. <laughs> yeah, with an with an actual abomination at the end of it. Um, yeah. And then you've got the Aliens versus Predator film, which no, just just none of them. <laughs> yeah, Paul uh, fucking W S Anderson uh, ruining the, films again. <laughs> Aliens and Predator coming together on screen should be brilliant and could be brilliant. Yeah, he cocked it up. Yeah, I and mean, then the next film did it even worse. <laughs> I don't know how you cock it up because I mean, what if this, if they really wanted to do it justice, they should have just done what they did in the comics. Yeah, it should have been post Aliens in space. Boom, easy. When you can make Jason X, and that's a better film than Alien versus Pred- uh, Predator. It really is, yeah. It's oh, a fantastic film. <laughs> I, I love Jason X. I've got a really soft spot for it. <laughs> so ridiculous, but knows it's ridiculous. Yeah. And it's got one of the best deaths that ways way puts a face in the nitrous. Yes. In the nitrogen. Yeah. That's such a great death. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, and, and that actually also gets somebody sucked out through a little hole in the spaceship. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And he does it in a better way than the. You don't see him sucked out by his ass. Yeah. Oh God. So bad. Alien so resurrection. Bad. God damn it. Poor Sigourney Weaver. Poor Ripley. We go through all that bollocks. The only thing I like about it is it's the first film that made me notice Ron Perlman. Yes. Wow. That's never a bad thing, is it? No. That's the silver lining I'll take away from that. <laughs> <laughs> did you? Ne- did you not never see Beauty and the Beast? No, I I never saw it. I oh, it's, it's a show I really want to go back and watch because it's okay. Ron Perlman and Linda Hamilton. It's like yeah, I want to see yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> it's really good. The first season is anyway. The second season, not so much. But the first season is, is fantastic. It's a really good show. Uh, but yeah, Perlman in anything um, mm. is is fantastic. He's he's great. Um, but aliens. Um, final thoughts on it, there, Amy. What? What is it? A film you would recommend to other people? I sure hope so. Since we just talked about it for nearly an hour. Oh, definitely. It's probably an example of one of the most perfect sequels in the sense of it takes everything great about the first film and does it bigger and better and differently from it, and is its own complete separate entity because you mm. can watch it on its own without having seen the first film, but it does complement the first film so perfectly as well. It's brilliantly put together, an amazing cast. The effects are are brilliant even today, like 30 years later. And if you've never seen it, you've really made a mistake. Please go and watch it. (laughs) Yeah, it definitely stands the test of time. Mm. And, and obviously gave rise to a lot of the video games because obviously there was a, an arcade game of it, which was yeah. fantastic. Um, and then you had NES games and SNES and all them as well. They're really good. And um, obviously you've got the Aliens versus Predator computer game on PC. Yeah. Which was... And really... It's informed so many f- other films and oh, comics so and everything games. as well. So, well, it's, it's, yeah, if, if you've never seen it and you go and watch it, you'll think... A lot of this feels familiar because Cameron's Marines just kind of became so iconic that any other group of Marines seems to take something from them. So you'll feel really at home watching it, and it's the one that did it first and probably the best as well. Well, it completely informed a lot of 40K. Uh, yeah. Things like the Gene Steelers and the Space Marines and all that kind of thing. Oh, Obviously, yeah. you've got the whole religious stuff. Uh, you know, that may set it apart from, from aliens. Mm. But if you play a game like Space Hulk, for example, that is yeah. aliens. It's just aliens. <laughs> it's like um, I, I recently got my girlfriend into 40K and oh. one of the selling points was, oh, you should look at the Tyranids. They're just the alien. And she's like, that, okay, that's awesome. <laughs> how, instantly, how, is she like, enjoying, yeah, how is she enjoying that rabbit hole? <laughs> oh my god we have no money anymore <laughs> no you won't see i refuse to play the games because i i like my kidneys where they are but i'll read the fluff i've got all the fluff i've got loads of the audio books and so it's fantastic but it's a brilliant it's like, universe but expensive to get into <laughs> we'll totally have to talk about it more but i one of the things i i do like I, i've got my friend at work into it and she was reading a few of the novels and she said 
there are no good guys in this, are there? I said, nope. Because <laughs> she said, well, when I started stop reading about mankind, I thought that they'd be the good guys, wouldn't they? I said, nope. <laughs> oh, so far from the truth. <laughs> the only people who are anywhere near being good are the Tau, and even they have their own motives for doing what they're doing. Yeah, but they are the nicest you get. Yeah, but that's that's like saying the shit sandwich from yesterday's slightly nicer because it's not as warm as the shit sandwich from today. It's, it's still a shit sandwich <laughs> at the end of the day, isn't it? You know, it's, it's still a horrific thing to have to eat. But yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's a fantastic universe. But like I say, the Tyranid stuff is completely yeah. alien. Uh, but that's that's you know that's a good thing that, that so much stuff has been sort of informed by this thing that it is a cultural touchstone. Yeah, and you know it's it's had its thirtieth anniversary. It was re-released in cinemas and stuff and it's i would not be surprised to see it again in another 20 years for the 50th being brought out again it's gonna it is gonna stand the test of time and this film is going to be around longer than the people who worked in it you know when sigourney's gone and james cameron's gone it's gonna still gonna be a film that's shown on tv in the cinemas and is always going to be cited as one of the best pieces of cinema i think I think it's because it, it's it's done that thing that Star Wars did that's very, very clever. It didn't do anything to try and date itself. Yeah. So none of the tech on there, you can't say it's unequivocally so futuristic as to be unattainable, but it's not close enough to what we got to be not futuristic. Yeah. It's like the, the furthest you can get away from that is the laptops they have on the sentry guns. But yeah. even that you can say, well... Yeah, they're big and clunky because they're battlefield tech. They've been designed to take a lot of damage, and you can get around stuff and explain it away. Yeah, and you never really see how the stuff there works as well. It's like they've got spaceships that can go faster than light. Don't know how. You never see yeah, it. They just turn up where they're going to go, and it's like, okay, yeah, that's. You don't have to compare that to how science is going. They just get there, and it works. Yeah. It's everything's functional. It's the mm. used future thing. You know, when you have. It's like Star Trek. In Star Trek, I. Yeah, I don't mind Star Trek. It's fine. But they're always, ooh, look at what this can do. Ooh, this is impressive. Ooh, look at this. And, you know, in, in Aliens and Star Wars, it's just, yeah, it's, this does this. It's, it's mm. always been like this. It's, you know, it's like getting into a car. When you get into a car, you don't go, ooh, look at this the internal combustion engine. Isn't this clever? You just get into a car and you go. Yeah. And that's that's kind of like um Han Solo with the Millennium Falcon just gets in, presses go and it goes. And there's there's no wonder, there's no sense of ooh, isn't this exciting? It's just something we do all the time. And it's the same thing in aliens. All the tech yeah. we use is just this is just what we do all the time. Um, and it would be easy for them to go the other route with Ripley having been in stasis for fifty years, going like, Oh, what's this? What does this mm. do? And they gain explain but they don't, they just Okay, she's been around now for another few months. She's up to date on what she needs to know. The other stuff, yeah. it doesn't matter. Just get on with it. And the fact that it's all very used and lived in as well, rather than being sort of more sterile and clinical like Star Trek, helps with that as well. It's just this isn't something new and wow. This is just people's lives. They just yeah. happen to be in space in the future. Which, like you know, like we said, it, it'll help it not to date, and that's that's yeah. a good thing because the film will be always around and it'll always be sort of relevant. I reckon. Yeah. Um, fantastic! Um, you should all go see Aliens right now if you've not seen it before, and if you've seen it before, go see it again. Yeah, because it's really good. And make it a double feature with Predator. Yes, oh, that's a um, good double feature, <laughs> which, we, which we talked about last week with Duncan. Um, and another, do you know, another film I put in there as well. Make it a triple feature. Stick Enemy Mine in there as well. Mm. You ever seen that one? Yes, really good film. Fantastic. One of my favourite films ever. You've just uh, reminded me of something as well, which Mm. I was going to say earlier. Um, Bill Paxton, you might might already know, he's the only person to die on screen from an alien, a predator and a terminator. Yes, he did. Yes, because he was in Predator 2 when he died, didn't he? And he was in... um, Terminator 2? Uh, Terminator 1. Terminator 1. one oh, yes, he was one of the cops. Punks at the beginning. Oh, yeah, of course he was. Because Lance Henriksen is the cop I'm thinking of. He died. Yeah. Um, he, he, he's been killed by two, but not three. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's not a bad record, though, is it? Yeah, that's good. They're the good company, those two. <laughs> and also Bill Paxton was turned into a shit by Kelly Brock. Kelly LeBrock. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. He's the quadruple whammy. Um, excellent stuff. Uh, Amy, it's been a pleasure having you on again. Oh, it's been absolutely fun. I've thoroughly enjoyed talking about this subject. <laughs> Oh, so well, we'll get you one again to talk about something else very soon, definitely. Um, but in the meantime, if somebody did want to check out Eccentric Earth, uh, how's the best way to do that? Or how's the best way to get in touch with you? Uh, well, me personally, I'm on Twitter at amazing underscore Amy underscore W. Um, there's links there to Eccentric Earth, or you can find that yourself by going to Twitter, which is eccentric underscore Earth. The show's on pretty much every major podcast provider itunes acast everything like that and it's on youtube as well um so come along and find us we do fun stories from history that the guests have no idea what it's going to be before they turn up and they get to learn about it as you do and yeah we've got a nice mix of stuff in there and it's a lot of fun a lot of the time part of the episodes i'm in <laughs> <laughs> but, well, yeah we've... you had a grim one but <laughs> <laughs> I had a fun one as well so there you go I'm, all, yeah. I'm one all at the moment um, excellent <laughs> stuff if you want to find me you can do so um, on Twitter which is at Cymru Nerd Cave if you want to find me on Facebook it's Glenn Jakeman please do send me a message before you try and add me though and then I know who you are if you want to find Back to the 80s on Twitter it's at BTTE Pod on Facebook, it's facebook.com forward slash B-T-T-E pod. Uh, if you want to find us on Libsyn, it's btte.libsyn.com. But we are on things like Stitcher and, and, and such as well. Um, also, you're on YouTube at Cymru Nerd Cave, where you will also find the podcast. Excellent stuff. Um, we'll leave you this week with Public Image Limited and Rise from 1986. No particular reason. It's just it's just a nice song. And uh, we'll leave you with a close down from 1986 from the BBC as well, from BBC One. Um, Amy. Glenn. Please do say goodbye to all the lovely people who listen. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you for listening. And come back again because Back to the 80s is awesome. And go visit Eccentric Earth because that is also awesome. We'll see you next time for some good stuff. Uh, until then, bye bye for now. Bye. Could be right.
Next week at 10 past 11, Andrew Cooper takes a close look at a piece of farmyard scenery we take for granted to explore the secret nature on a dry stone wall. BBC One's lineup for tomorrow evening looks like this. And at 7, Terry Wogan's guests include Peter Cushing, Impressionist Gary Wilmot, and the new Miss Ballroom Dancing 1986. Then at 7.35, American domestic comedy in It's Your Move, followed at 8 by Scott Free when Selina Scott meets an ex-folk singer turned Scottish landowner, the Baron of Towie Barclay. Dear John gets an invitation to a party at half past eight, and then, after the nine o'clock news, at 9.30, Panorama reports on the uncertain state of French socialism, with an eye to next Sunday's general election in France. Finally, the Monday spy story stars Dirk Bogart and Ava Gardner in a story of ruthless blackmail on the international espionage scene. Permission to kill at ten past ten tomorrow night, on one. On to the weather forecast now, and some dense fog patches are likely tonight, but they'll clear fairly quickly tomorrow, except near some coasts. Many places will start dry, but showers will develop by midday, especially in eastern England and Scotland, where some could be quite heavy. Most western areas will have a dry afternoon with quite a lot of sunshine. Temperatures tomorrow will range from 7 degrees Celsius, 45 Fahrenheit in the east, to 9 or 10 Celsius, near 50 degrees Fahrenheit in some western areas. Just before we close, you might like to know that Her Majesty the Queen's official message to the Commonwealth will be broadcast for the first time as part of the Midnight News on BBC Radio 4. And Radio 2 is still going strong as well. At the moment, Desmond Carrington has a programme of listeners' favourite music. And then at 1am, Ken Bruce will be along for two's best. We hope you've enjoyed the evening on BBC One. And on behalf of everyone here, this is Lorna Thomas wishing you good night. <laughs>